We're on act two, scene one of A Raisin in the Sun. Time. Later the same day, at rise, Ruth, Ruth is ironing again. She has the radio going, presently. Benita's bedroom door opens and Ruth's mouth falls and she puts down the iron in fascination. Ruth, what have we got on tonight? Benita, emerging grandly from the doorway so that we can see her thoroughly robed in the costume a Sagai brought. You are looking at what a well-dressed Nigerian woman wears. She parades for Ruth, her hair completely hidden by the headdress. She is, she is coquettishly fanning herself with an ornate oriental fan, mistakenly more like butterfly than any Nigerian than ever was. Isn't it beautiful? She promenades to the radio and with an arrogant flourish turns off the good loud blues that is playing. Enough of this assimilation is junk. Ruth follows her with her eyes as she goes to the phone phonograph and puts on a record and turns and waits ceremoniously for the music to come up then with a shout Oko Mogosi I don't know Ruth jumps the music comes up a lovely Nigerian melody beneath the listens enraptured her eyes far away back to the past she begins to dance Ruth is dumbfounded Ruth what kind of dance is that beneath the, a folk dance Ruth Pearl Bailey what kind of folks do that honey Benita, it's from Nigeria. It's a dance of welcome. Ruth, who you welcoming? Benita, the men back to the village. Ruth, where they been? Benita, how should I know? Out hunting or something. Anyway, they are coming back now. Ruth, well, that's good. Benita, with the record. Alundi, 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 Alunya. Jopu Ajipua. Angu Sugo. Ayaye. Ayaye, Alundi. Walter comes in during this performance. He has obviously been drinking. He leans against the door heavily and watches his sister, at first with distaste, then his eyes look off back to the past as he lifts both his fists to the roof, screaming, Walter, yeah, and Ethiopia stretched forth her hands again. Ruth, dryly looking at him, yes, and Africa sure is claiming her own tonight. She gives them both up and starts ironing again. Walter, all in a drunken, dramatic shout, Shut up, I'm digging them drums, them drums move me. He makes his weaving way to his wife's face and leans in close to her. In my heart of hearts, he dumps his chest. I am much warrior. Ruth, without even looking up, in your heart of hearts, you are much drunker. <laughs> Walter, coming away from her and starting to wander around the room, shouting, me and Jomo, intent intently in his sister's face. She has stopped dancing to watch him in this unknown mood. That's my man, Kenyatta, shouting and thumping his chest. Flaming spear, hot damn. He is suddenly in possession of an imaginary spear and actively spearing enemies all over the room. Oko Mogusiai. Benita, to encourage Walter, thoroughly caught up with this side of him. Caught up with this side of him. Oko Mogusiai, flaming spear. <laughs> Walter, the lion is waking. Owe Mowe. He pulls his shirt open and leaps up on the table and gestures with his spear. So they're just, they're role playing as if they're Nigerian. Benita, oh, Imowe, Walter, on the table, very far gone, his eyes pure glass sheets. He sees what we cannot, that he is a leader of his people, a great chief, a descendant of Chaka, and that the hour to march has come. Listen, my black brothers, Benita, Okomogo, C.A. Walter, do you hear the waters rushing against the shores of the coastlands? Benita, Okomogo, C.A. Walter, do you hear the screeching of the cocks in the yonder hills beyond where the chiefs meet in council for the coming of the mighty war? Beneath the Okomogusie. And now the lighting shifts subtly to suggest the world of Walter's imagination and the mood shifts from pure comedy. It is the inner Walter speaking. The south side chauffeur has assumed an unexpected majesty. Walter, do you hear the beating of the wings of the birds flying low over the mountains in the low places of our land? Beneath the Okomogusie. Walter, do you hear the singing of the women singing the war songs of our fathers to the babies in the great houses? Singing the sweet war songs. The doorbell rings. Oh, do you hear, my black brothers? Benita, completely gone. We hear you, flaming spear. <laughs> Ruth shuts off the phonograph and opens the door. George Murchison enters. Walter, telling us to prepare for the greatness of the time. Lights back to normal. He turns and sees George. Black brother, he extends his hand for the frac uh, fraternal clasp with the handshake, a brotherly handshake. George, black brother, hell. Ruth, having had enough and embarrassed for the family. Benita, you got company. What's the matter with you? 
Walter Lee Younger, get down off that table and stop acting like a fool. Walter comes down off the table and suddenly and makes a quick exit to the bathroom. Ruth, he's had a little to drink. I don't know what her excuse is. George to Benita. Look, honey, we're going to the theater. We're not going to be in it, so go change, huh? Benita looks at him and slowly, ceremoniously lifts her hands and pulls off the headdress. Her hair is close-cropped and unstraightened. George freezes mid-sentence and Ruth's eyes all but fan out of her head. George, what in the name of Ruth touching Benita's hair? Girl, you done lost your natural mind. Look at your head. George, what have you done to your head? I mean your hair. Benita, nothing except cut it off. Ruth, now that's the truth. It's what ain't been done to it. It's what ain't been done to it. You expect this boy to go out with you with your head all nappy like that? Benita looking at George. That's up to George if he's ashamed of his heritage. George, oh, don't be so proud of yourself, Benny, just because you look eccentric. Benita, how can something that's natural be eccentric? George, that's what being eccentric means, being natural, get dressed. Benita, I don't like that, George. Ruth, why must you and your brother make an argument out of everything people say? Benita, because I hate us. Because I hate assimilationist Negroes. Ruth, will somebody please tell me what assimile whoever means? George, oh, it's just a college girl's way of calling people Uncle Tom's, but that isn't what it means at all. Ruth, well, what does it mean? Benita, cutting George off and staring at him as she replies to Ruth. It means someone who is willing to give up his own culture and submerge himself completely in the dominant, and in this case, oppressive culture. George, oh dear, 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 here we go, a lecture on the African past, on our great West African heritage. In one second, we will hear all about the great Ashanti empires, the great Songhai civilizations, and the great sculpture of Benin, and then some poetry in the Bantu, and the whole monologue will end with the word heritage, nastily. Let's face it, let's face it, baby, your heritage is nothing but a bunch of raggedy-ass spirituals and some grass huts. Beneath the grass huts? Ruth crosses to her and forcibly pushes her toward the bedrooms. See there, you are standing there in your splendid ignorance, talking about people who were the first to smell iron on the face of the earth. Ruth is pushing her through the door. The, Ash the Ashanti were performing surgical operations when the English... Ruth pulls the door too, with Benita on the other side and smiles graciously at George. Benita opens the door and shouts the end of the sentence defiantly at George. We're still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. Also, she's saying, uh, the Ashanti were performing surgical operations when the English were still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. She goes back inside. Ruth, have a seat, George. They both sit. Ruth folds her hands rather primly on her lap, determined to demonstrate the civilization of the family. Warm, ain't it? I mean, for September? Pause. Just like they always say about Chicago weather, if it's too hot or cold for you, just wait a minute and it'll change. She smiles happily at this cliche of cliches. Everybody say it's got to do with them bombs and things they keep setting off. Pause. Would you like a nice cold beer? George. No, thank you. I don't care for beer. He looks at his watch. I hope she hurries up. Ruth. What time is the show? George. It's an 8.30 curtain. That's just Chicago, though. In New York, standard current time is 8.40. He is rather proud of this knowledge. Ruth, properly appreciating it. You get to New York a lot? George, offhand. A few times a year. Ruth, oh, that's nice. I've never been to New York. Walter enters. We feel he has relieved himself, but the edge of unreality is still with him. Walter, New York ain't got nothing. Chicago ain't. Just a bunch of hustling people all squeezed up together, being Eastern. He turns his face into a screw of displeasure. George, oh, you've been? Walter, plenty of times. Ruth, shocked at the lie. Walter Lee, younger. Walter, staring at her, staring her down. Plenty. Pause. What we got to drink in this house? Why don't you offer this man some refreshment? To George, they don't know how to entertain people in this house, man. George, thank you. I don't really care for anything. Walter, filling his head, sobriety coming. Where's mama? Ruth, she ain't come, she ain't come back yet. Walter, looking Murchison over from head to toe, scrutinizing his carefully casual tweed sports jacket over a cashmere v-neck sweater over soft eyelid shirt and tie and soft slacks finished off with white buckskin shoes why all you college boys wear them faggoty looking white shoes ruth walter lee george murchison ignores the remark walter to ruth well they look crazy as hell white shoes cold as it is ruth crushed you have to excuse him walter no he don't Excuse me for what? What are you always excusing me for? I'll excuse myself when I needs to be excused. They look as funny as in black knee socks beneath the wears out, out of here all the time. Ruth, it's the college style, Walter. 
Walter, style hell. She looks like she got burnt legs or something. Ruth, oh Walter. Walter, an irritable mimic. Oh Walter, oh Walter. To Murchison, how's your old man making out? I understand you all going to buy that big hotel on the drive. He finds a beer in the refrigerator, wanders over to Murchison, sipping and wiping his lips with the back of his hand and straddling a chair backwards to talk to the other man. Shrewd move, your old man is all right, man, tapping his head and half winking for emphasis. I mean, he knows how to operate. I mean, he thinks big, you know what I mean? I mean, for a home, you know? But I think he's kind of running out of ideas now. I'd like to talk to him. Listen, man, I got some plans that could turn the city upside down. I mean, think like he does. Big, invest big, gamble big, hell, lose big if you have to, you know what I mean? It's hard to find a man on this whole south side who understands my kind of thinking, you dig? He scrutinizes Murchison again, drinks his beer, squints his eyes, and leans in, his, leans in close, confidential, man to man. Me and you ought to sit down and talk sometimes, man. Man, I got me some ideas, George, with boredom. Yeah, sometimes we'll have to do that, Walter. Walter, understanding the indifference and offended. Yeah, well, when you get the time, man, I know you a busy little boy. Ruth, Walter, please. Walter, bitterly hurt. I know ain't nothing in this world as busy as you colored college boys with your fraternity pins and white shoes. Ruth, covering her face with humiliation. Oh, Walter Lee. Walter, I see you all the time with the books tucked under your arms, going to your British AA mimic classes. And for what? What the hell are you learning over there? Filling up your heads, counting off on his fingers with the, soci the sociology. sociology and the psychology but they teaching you how to be a man how to take over and run the world they teaching you how to run a rubber plantation or steel mill nah just to talk proper and read books and wear them faggoty looking white shoes george looking at him with the george looking at him with distaste a little above it all you're all whacked up with bitterness man <laughs> walter intently almost quietly between the teeth glaring at the boy and you ain't you bitter man ain't you just about had it yet don't you see no stars gleaming that you can't reach out and grab? You happy? You contented son of a bitch? You happy? You got it made? Bitter? Man, I'm a volcano. Bitter? Here I am a giant surrounded by ants. Ants who can't even understand what it is the giant is talking about. Ruth, passionately and suddenly. Oh, Walter, ain't you with, ain't you with nobody? Walter, violently. No, because ain't nobody with me, not even my own mother. Ruth. Walter, that's a terrible thing to say. Benita enters, dressed for the evening in a cocktail dress and earrings. Hair natural. This is a long ass, uh. What's it called? A long ass act. All natural. So she came out all natural. Uh, like George. Well, hey, crosses to Benita. Thoughtful with emphasis since this is, this is a reversal. You look great. Walter, seeing his sister's hair for the first time. What's the matter with your head? Benita, tired of the jokes now. I cut it off, brother. Walter, coming close to inspect it and walking around her. Well, I'll be damned, so that's what they mean by the African bush. Benita, ha ha, let's go, George. <laughs> George, looking at her. You know something? I like it. It's sharp. I mean, it really is. Helps her into her wrap. Ruth, yes, I think so, too. She goes to the mirror and starts to clutch at her hair. Walter, oh no, you leave yours alone, baby. You might turn out to have a pin-shaped head or something. Benita, see you all later. Ruth, have a nice time. George, thanks, good night. Half out the door, he reopens it to Walter. Good night, Prometheus. Benita and George exit. Walter to Ruth, who is Prometheus? Ruth, I don't know, don't worry about it. Walter in fury, pointing after George. See there, they get to a point where they can't insult. They can't insult you man to man. They got to go talking about something that nobody never heard of. <laughs> Ruth, how do you know it was an insult to humor him? Maybe Prometheus is a nice fellow. Walter, Prometheus? I bet there ain't even no such thing. I bet that simple-minded clown. Ruth, Walter, she stops what she is doing and looks at him. Walter, yelling, don't start. Ruth, start what? Walter, you're nagging. Where was I? Who was I with? How much money did I spend? Ruth, plaintively. Walter Lee, why don't we just try to talk about it? Walter, not listening. I've been out talking with people who understand me, people who care about the things I got on my mind. Ruth, wearily. I guess that means people like Willie Harris. Walter, yes, people like Willie Harris. Ruth, with a sudden flash of impatience, why don't you all just hurry up and go into the banking business and stop talking about it? Walter, why? You want to know why? Because we all tied up in a race of people that don't know how to do nothing but moan, pray, and have babies. The line is too bitter even for him, and he looks at her and sits down. Ruth, oh, Walter, softly, honey... Why can't you stop fighting me? 
Walter, without thinking. Who's fighting you? Who even cares? Who even cares about you? This line begins the retardation of his mood. Ruth, well, she waits a long time and then with resignation starts to put away her things. I guess I might as well go on to bed, more or less to herself. I don't know where we lost it, but we have. And to him, I, I'm sorry about this new baby, Walter. I guess maybe I better go on and do what I started. I guess I just didn't realize how bad things was with us. I guess I just didn't really realize. She starts out to the bedroom and stops. You want some hot milk? Walter, hot milk? Yes, hot milk, Ruth says. Walter, why hot milk? Ruth, because after all that liquor you come home with, you ought to have something hot in your stomach. Walter, I don't want no milk. Ruth, you want some coffee then? Walter, no, I don't want no coffee. I don't want nothing, no hot drink. Almost plaintively. Why are you always trying to give me something to eat? Ruth, standing and looking at him helplessly. What else can I give you, Walter the Younger? She stands and looks at him and presently turns to go out again. He lifts his head and watches her going away from him in a new mood which began to emerge when he asked her, Who cares about you? Now she's such a beautiful woman, man. Walter, it's been rough, ain't it, baby? She hears and stops but does not turn around and he continues to her back. And he continues to her back. I guess between two people, there ain't never as much understood as folks generally thinks there is. I guess between two people, there ain't never as much understood as folks generally think there is. I mean, like between me and you. She turns to face him. How we get to the place where we scared to talk about softness to each other. He waits thinking hard himself. Why you think it got to be like that? He is thoughtful almost as a child would be. Ruth, what is it gets into people ought to be close? What is it gets into people ought to be close? Or what gets into people that should be closer? Ruth, I don't know, honey. I think about it a lot. Walter, on account of you and me, you mean? The way things are with us? The way something done come down between us? Ruth, there ain't, there ain't so much between us, Walter. Not when you come to me and try to talk to me, try to be with me, a little even. Walter, total honesty. Sometimes, sometimes I don't even know how to try. Ruth, Walter? Yes. No, Walter says yes. Ruth, coming to him gently and with misgiving, but coming to him. Honey, life don't have to be like this. I mean, sometimes people can do things so that things are better. You remember how we used to talk when Travis was born about the way we were going to live? The kind of house? She is stroking his head while it's all starting to slip away from us. He turns to him. He turns her to him and they look at each other and kiss tenderly and hungrily. The door opens and Mama enters. Walter breaks away and jumps up a beat. Walter. Mama, where have you been? Mama, my. Them steps is longer than they used to be. Woo. She sits down and ignores him. How you feeling this evening, Ruth? Ruth shrugs, disturbed at having been interrupted and watching her husband knowingly. Walter, Mama, where have you been all day? Mama, still ignoring him and leaning on the table and changing to more comfortable shoes. Where's Travis? Ruth, I let him go out earlier. He ain't come back yet. Boy, is he going to get it. Walter, Mama. Mama, as if she has heard him for the first time. Yes, son. Walter, where did you go this afternoon? Mama, I went downtown to tend some business that I had to tend. Walter, what kind of business? Mama, you know better than to ask, to ask me questions. Uh, you know you know better than to question me like a child, brother. Walter, rising and bending over the table. Where were you, Mama? Bringing his fist down and shouting. Mama, you didn't go do something with that insurance money, something crazy. The front door opens slowly, interrupting him, and Travis peeks his head in less than hopefully. Travis, to his mother, Mama, I... Ruth, Mama, I nothing. You're going to get it, boy. Get on in that bedroom and get yourself ready. Travis, but I, Mama, why don't you, why don't you all never let the child explain itself? Ruth, keep out of it now, Lena. Mama clamps her lips together, and Ruth advances toward her son menacingly. Ruth, a thousand times I have told you not to go off like that. Mama, holding out her arms to her grandson. Well, at least let me tell him something. I want him to be the first one to hear. Come here, Travis. The boy obeys gladly. Travis. She takes him by the shoulder and looks into his face. You know that money that we got in the mail this morning? Travis, yes, um, Mama, well, what do you think your grandmama gone and done with that money? Travis, I don't know, grandmama. Mama, putting her finger on his nose for emphasis, she went out and she bought you a house. The explosion comes from Walter at the end of the revelation and he jumps up and turns away from all of them in a fury. Mama continues to Travis, you glad about the house? It's going to be yours when you get to be a man. Travis, yeah, always wanted to live in a house. Mama, all right, give me some sugar then. Travis puts his arms around her neck as she watches her son over the boy's shoulder. Then to Travis after the embrace. Now when you say your prayers tonight, you thank God and your grandfather because it was him who gave you the house in his way. 
Ruth taking the boy from mama and pushing him toward the bedroom. Now you get out of here and get ready for your beating. Travis, ah, mama, Ruth. Get on in there, closing the door behind him and turning radiantly to her mother-in-law. So you went on and did it? Mama, quietly looking at her son with pain. Yes, I did. Ruth, raising both arms classically. Praise God. Looks at Walter a moment, who says nothing. She, she crosses rapidly to her husband. Husband. Please, honey, let me be glad. You be glad too. She laid her hands on his shoulders, but he shakes himself free of her roughly without turning to, uh, to face her. Oh, Walter. A home, a home. She comes back to Mama. Well, where is it? How big is it? How much is it going to cost? Mama. Well, Ruth, when we moving? Mama, smiling at her. First of the month. Ruth, throwing back her head with jubilance. Praise God. Mama, attentively, still looking at her son's back, turned against her and Ruth. It's, it's a nice house, too. She cannot help speaking directly to him. An imploring quality in her voice. Her manner makes her almost like a girl now. Three bedrooms. Nice big one for you and Ruth. Me and Benita still have to share our room, but Travis have one of his own. And with difficulty, I figure if she, new baby, is a boy, we would get one of them double-decker outfits and there's a yard with a little patch of dirt where I could maybe get to grow me a, a few flowers in a nice big basement. Ruth, Walter, honey, be glad. Mama, still to his back, fingering things on the table. Of course, I don't want to make it sound fancier than it is. It's just a plain little old house, but it's made good and solid and it will be ours. Walter Lee, it makes a difference in a man when he can walk on floors that belong to him. Ruth, where is it? Mama, frightened at this telling. Well, well, it's out there in Clybourne Park. Ruth's radiance fades abruptly and Walter finally turns slowly to face his mother with incredulity and hostility. Ruth, where? Mama, matter of factly. Uh, Mama, matter of factly. 406 Clybourne Street, Clybourne Park. Ruth, Clybourne Park? Mama, they ain't no colored people living at Clybourne Park. Mama, almost idiotically. Well, I guess there's going to be some now. Walter, bitterly. So that's the peace and comfort you went out and bought for us today? Mama, raising her eyes to meet his, meet his finally. Son, I just tried to find the nicest place for the least amount of money for my family. Ruth, trying to recover from the shock. Well, well, of course I ain't one never been afraid of no crackers, mind you, but well, wasn't there no other houses nowhere? Mama, them houses they put up for colored in them areas way out all seem to cost twice as much as the other houses. I did the best I could. Ruth, struck senseless with the news in its various degrees of goodness and trouble. She, she sits a moment, her fist propping her chin in thought, and then she starts to rise, bringing her fist down with vigor, the radiance spreading from cheek to cheek again. Well, well, all I can say is, if this is my time in life, my time to say goodbye. And she builds with momentum as she starts to circle the room with an exuberant, almost tearfully happy release. To these goddamn cracking walls, she pounds the walls. And these marching roaches, she wipes at an imaginary army of marching roaches. And this cramped little closet, which ain't now or never was no kitchen. Then I say it loud and good, hallelujah. And goodbye, misery. I don't ever want to see your ugly face again. She laughs joyously, having practically destroyed the apartment, and flings her arms up and lets them come down happily, slowly, reflectively over her abdomen, aware for the first time, perhaps, that the life therein pulses with happiness and not despair. Lena? Mama, moved, watching her happiness. Yes, honey? Ruth, looking off. Is there? Is there a whole lot of sunlight? Mama, understanding. Yes, child, there's a whole lot of sunlight. Long pause. Ruth, collecting herself and going to the door of the room. Travis is in. Well, I guess I better see about Travis. To Mama, Lord, I sure don't feel like whipping nobody today. She exits. Mama, the mother and son are left alone now, and the mother waits a long time, considering deeply before she speaks. Son, you, you understand what I done, don't you? Walter is silent and sullen. I, I just see my family falling apart today, just falling to pieces in front of my eyes. We couldn't have gone on like we was today. We was going backwards instead of forwards, talking about killing babies and wishing each other was dead. When it gets like that in life, you must got to do something different. Push on out and do something bigger. She waits. I wish you'd say something, son. I wish you'd say how deep inside you, you, you think I'd done the right thing. Walter, crossing slowly to his bedroom door and finally turning there and speaking measurely. What well, you need me to say you done right for. You're the head of this family. You run our lives like you want to. It was your money and you did what you wanted with it. So what you need me to say it was all right for. Bitterly to hurt her as deeply as he knows it is possible. So you butchered up a dream of mine. You who always talking about your children's dreams. Mama, Walter Lee. He just closes the door behind him. Mama sits alone thinking heavily. Curtain. All right, let's do a little breakdown. So Benita's getting ready to go on her date. 
Walter's getting drunk. He comes in when Benita and her friend picking her up to go on the date are there. He's acting rude to the date. He's just bitter, you know. He's waiting for his mom to get home. Mama finally gets home. Uh, the little Travis, the little son gets home. The Ruth wants to whip her son. But then Mama comes home, which is her mother-in-law. She ends up buying a house, but her son wanted her to give him the money to invest in some sort of business idea. But it would have been all the $10,000, you know. You can start small. You don't have to spend all your money. You know what I'm saying? I just think he was rushing into something. But she went on and bought a house for the family, which is a beautiful thing. And uh, that's kind of where it ends. And the son's still being a little dickhead. And um, Mama, which is the grandmother, which is the the wife of the man who died and left that $10,000. So, But they bought a home in an all-white neighborhood. And who knows uh, at this time, it's going to be difficult. But uh, I think in the long run, owning a property in that area in the future, that, that family is just going to have to deal with, you know, the racism, I guess. It's an interesting book, man. Anyway, y'all, that was Act 2, Scene 1. Peace.